All right, all right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. It's your buddy CJ here. And tonight we're talking about all things cars, 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 the automotive industry, real gearhead talk. This is where the real gearheads come to talk, like you and me. We have a lot of fun around here. We talk about all things related to cars and the car scene and the automotive industry, cool cars, uncool cars, trends that we're seeing in the industry. We talk about them together, just like car guys would do, you know, over a cup of beers or a cup of coffee. We do it here on this podcast, and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. Guys, welcome. I'm glad you're all here. Love you all. I'm so grateful for you. Please do give me a like and subscribe. Leave me comments. I'll respond to all the comments I can. We're getting a lot of great interaction. I'm really enjoying this. Listen, we are having so much fun. There might be a law against this, guys, having this kind of fun together. But in all seriousness, let's get right into it. So tonight, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about a topic, and we're going to talk kind of direct about it. Uh, and that topic is buying your first supercar or exotic sports car. We're talking about making the decision to step up from, you know, just one class of car into the next. It's tiers. And that's not to say that muscle cars or, you know, micro sports cars or, or Japanese cars or, you know, Mustangs, Challengers, Corvettes, Camaros. There's nothing wrong with those cars. People spend an entire automotive enthusiast lifetime on those cars. But for some of you and for some of us, uh, we like to sort of take a, dare I say, a rotational approach. Or we like to continually uh, get into different classes and different styles of cars. So as a modern automotive enthusiast, maybe you're an up and comer. Uh, maybe you're a young man or woman uh, and you've, you've currently been in sort of one bracket of cars and you're considering getting into the next bracket. You know, there are steps to this, just like your buddy CJ is going to tell you, just like there's brackets of income, there's brackets of houses, there's brackets of vacations that you can choose to take. If you're going to go buy a boat, there are brackets. There's a fishing boat, utility boat, you know, something that a couple people could get in and have fun. But then there's a pontoon boat. Then there's a, there's a Donzi. <laughs> there's a high-end cigarette boat and all these. Like there are tiers to this. There's levels, right? to the automotive enthusiast hobby. So don't take anything I say as saying that one tier is better or worse than another. It's not, it's just different. It's just different brackets, different price points and tiers. You know, the American muscle hobby or aspect of the hobby and the ownership experience is just very different from exotic sports car to supercar to JDM car uh, to vintage English car from the 1960s. These are just different tiers, different bands of the hobby. So again, what we're getting into tonight are all those things that I want you to consider because I care about you and I love you. All the things that you should consider before getting into the exotics, before buying your first super sports car and what should that be? So let's get into it, as I said. And the first piece of advice I will give you as I would say to any of my friends, as I would say to my kids, okay, and it may surprise you and you may not like my advice, but my first message to you, now may not be the time to buy this car for you. I want you to look closely and do some internal reflection. I want you to analyze where you're at financially. I want you to review your priorities. I want you to consider where you're at with disposable income, you know, and some of these things would apply whether you were telling me you were going out to buy a 2010 Camaro V6 or a boat or a Harley Davidson. Like before you invest in something that's a hobby, okay, something that's superfluous, something that you just buy not out of necessity, but out of want. We've got to have some adult talk, all right? And we got to have some real talk. Real talk, you know, we love that around here. So what I'm here to tell you guys is that, you know, first things first, let's look at where you're at. There are phases to life, right? I don't want to get too philosophical this evening. We have a lot of fun on this channel. That's mission number one and always will be. But I want to, I want to let you know that 
you know, with things like exotic cars, supercars, super sports cars, that type of thing, we're talking about things that typically you shouldn't even consider. You really shouldn't consider until you reach a level of comfort and stability and a level of disposable income where you can afford it. Your buddy CJ does not want you getting over your head financially, you know, uh, which brings me to my next point, which says once you've determined that maybe this is the right time to buy, to step up from a $30,000 car to an eighty dollars to $90,000 car, from a $60,000 car to a $120,000 car, from an $80,000 car to a $160,000 car. These are big jumps. That's what I'm talking about tonight. These are big jumps. It's a big deal. We're talking about a lot of money. And if you're super wealthy, if you're rich, you don't care, right? You're already there. You, you're already successful. You got money to burn. You do what you want. This video may not be for you. I'm not talking to you. It's not about you. I'm talking to the young automotive enthusiast or just the automotive enthusiast of any age who's saying, you know, I've been at this level of car. I want to up my game in some way. I want something different. I want to go exotic. I want to see what that life is all about. I want that ownership experience. So it's attainable. It's achievable. But let's talk about the next thing I wanted to bring up, which are the financial aspects specifically and budget. So a couple of things, developing a budget and sticking to it. If you're like CJ and you buy your cars in part based on passion and love and desire, mm, whoop, whoop, problems, red alert. And I've been guilty of it. You know, we all, it's like going into the candy store. What do we say? Kid in the candy store? If we show up at the exotic car dealership, kid in the candy store, I want that one. I want that one. Oh, but wait a minute. I can afford this one. But what about that one? Ooh, if I can afford that one, what about this one? And the salesmen, let's face it. They're not there to be your friend. Salesmen are not your friends. They're there for business. They're there to separate you from what's in your pocket. Make no mistake. They're not your buddies. Go to the car dealership. That's a business transaction. You're a consumer. You're a mark. And if they can step you up into something, don't, don't believe the hype. Your buddy CJ's in your corner, 100%. Salesmen trying to sell to you, okay? They don't have your best interest at heart. They don't. Stop it. There's a conflict of interest. Real talk. And I have friends that are in the automotive uh, retail sales business, all right? They're car salesmen, okay? It's not a bad thing, but it's just reality, you know? Your buddy CJ's your friend, not everybody else. I'm looking out for you. <laughs> a little fun tonight, but seriously. Come up with a budget that's reasonable and then start looking. And how do we do that, right? We look at financial models. We, we, we cost it out. Should you buy the vehicle for cash? Should you look at financing? If so, how much should I put down, CJ? I'm not your financial advisor. OK, I will generally say you should be super aware of the financial products that are out there. For example, the loans of the dealership, the banks they work with may not be your best bet. There are credit unions. Again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not your legal counsel. It's your buddy CJ. I'm a fellow car guy and I'm sharing my experience and perspective that you're going to want to look at things like credit unions. Do your research. Your bank might offer you a more favorable rate as opposed to the rate they're gonna offer you in the dealership. Now, conversely, the dealership may have some financial incentives. So there's always that. Should you buy verse lease? Generally speaking, uh, and I'm not gonna get into all that. I'm not gonna get into lease versus buy review. Uh, how boring, but explore your options. There are also financial institutions, for example, that will offer a 120 month loan at a higher percentage rate. It might be 9% to 12%. Now, should you do those things? Listen, the frugal, conservative financial advisor would probably tell you no. But then again, there might be a scenario where those loans do make sense. Right now, the cost of money is quite high. Interest rates are high. And that's a consideration. That's also been one of the contributing factors to a lot of these exotic cars and supercars coming down in price. You know, it's just the reality. Not as many people are buying. During COVID, that... That, that lightning in a bottle where the cost of money was so low, everybody was refinancing their homes. Okay, those days are gone. Those days are gone. If you did it, it was great. If you bought a car, and let's say you got that car at 
annual percentage rate <laughs> and it's sitting in your garage, you may not want to sell it because if you sell it and then you step up into another car, let's say you got the Dodge Challenger sitting out in your garage and you're looking at Porsches, you're looking at Ferraris, whatever the heck it is. You're at 3% on that Dodge Challenger Hellcat, Red Eye, SRT. But if you get that Porsche GT3, the best rate you're going to get right now is 7 8 9%. So it's a factor, right? I'm not saying it's the only factor. And depending on where you're at financially, where you're at income-wise, disposable, you know, dis disposable dollars that you have at the end of the month, you got to make some financial decisions. There are 10-year loans available. I mentioned 120 months. Okay. There's balloon loans. Again, I'm not here to get into all the various constructs. Hell, should you set up a Montana LLC? We're not going there. The point being... Do your research. And the other thing I want to say about financial aspect, real talk, look at me, come closer. You will probably lose money on this car. Now, for some of you, that's self-evident. But I know one of the common things, I got a whole other episode on dumb things car guys say. And I don't care if this bothers anybody. It's big facts. Most of the guys who tell you, including the salesman, some salesmen, not all, you'll never lose money on this car yet. Yeah. Eight times out of 10, that's, that's nonsense. You will lose money on the car. I had a salesman tell me probably three months ago at a car, I was actually ready to buy if we could have, you know, we weren't quite there in negotiation. But this dude, and I won't go into the car, the dealership, I could, but I won't. It's, it's true though. Your buddy CJ tells it like it is. Tell me, you know, CJ, you buy this car as long as you put less than 5,000 miles on it per year. You won't lose. In fact, you'll probably make money. And so I turned around. I looked at him. True story. I said, so you have a crystal ball. You can predict the future. Because I can't. And you can't tell me that. This salesman told me that. You know? So why do I share that story? Again, I'm not here to bash car salesmen. But I am here with a sincere concern for you my listeners, my subscribers, and fellow car guys and girls, particularly the next up and coming generation. I don't want you to get a noose around your neck financially. I don't want you to lose your shirt. Most car guys, real talk, most car guys have lost their shirt on cars. And it's kind of like, you know, everybody you know who's into gambling and goes to Las Vegas, you ever notice that none of them claim to lose any money? You ever notice that? People aren't, not everybody's honest as we are with each other on Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. Your buddy CJ always gives it to you straight with no nonsense. But guys, in all seriousness, a lot of people, you know, oh, I didn't lose money on that car. I made money. Don't believe what you hear. All right. What's the old saying? There's two sides to most stories and then there's the truth, at least. Same thing applies here. Like, don't believe a lot of hype that you might hear. If you buy this Ferrari, you'll never lose money. You don't know that. You buy this Lamborghini, you'll do better than that Lamborghini. You don't know that. Oh, buy this car because it's the last year and you're going to make money. You don't know that. Same thing applies with these exotic cars that are of a certain age, a few years in the sweet spot that have depreciated. It might be attractive to you. You know, it kind of comes down to if you can buy a Ferrari for Mustang money, should you? For example, let's talk about this. You could go out right now and buy a loaded Mustang Dark Horse for sixty to 80000 For that same money, there are certain exotic cars you could buy. They will not be brand new. They will be pre-loved, pre-used, maybe abused. They got some miles on them. You don't know. Over the past 10 years, 8 years, 15 years, has the car been abused? I don't know and you don't know. Don't believe what the salesman tells you. They don't know. So should you? Can, should you buy a McLaren for Corvette money? Should you buy a Lamborghini for Dodge Challenger Hellcat money? Tough question maybe to answer. We're going to talk about some of those things next. Okay. So let's get into this, right? We talked about the, the financial aspects, guys. We talked about being ready, phase of life, 
you know, to step into the next tier of car. And again, I'm not here trying to talk you out of anything. That's, that's not what your buddy CJ would ever do is to try to talk you out of something. But I do want to give it to you straight and maybe give you some perspective that you hadn't thought about. Okay, let's take a look at this. This is a Ferrari 360 Modena. Okay, these cars are absolutely beautiful. When I think about a gorgeous Ferrari, it's the Ferrari 360 for me. Tell me in the comments what you think. These cars, the lines, it's just so sexy. It's so gorgeous. It's so sleek. Okay, the headlights, I'll be honest with you. They're starting to age, you know? They're not aging well, the headlights on this car, in my opinion. They're starting to show their age. But a lot of people would struggle to even be able to tell what year this Ferrari is. This one happens to have, I believe those are 430 wheels, F430 wheels, but they're, it's a Ferrari 360. Beautiful car in a good color too. It's a 20-year-old car. So here's a good example. You could get into a Ferrari 360 Modena or even a Spider, let's say 80,000 to 120,000. You could. There are those that are more expensive, 10 to 20% or more. There are those that are less expensive, 10 to 20% or more. But let's say, for the sake of argument, sweet spot in today's market, 80 to 120,000, you could buy a Ferrari 360. The question is, should you? So what else is out there in that 80 to 120K uh, price range? You know, could you get a Nissan GTR? Could you get a Dodge Challenger Hellcat Red Eye? Could you get you know, uh, a fully loaded, brand new Corvette Stingray with all the bells and whistles. Yes, you could for the same money. So, and we talked about this, like you're getting in, now you're getting into deep water with a Ferrari. What do I mean by that? You buy this car, your buddy CJ's advice is first things first. Let's say this is a $110,000 car. Multiply that by 20%. Simple math, that's $24,000, $25,000. I want you to have twenty dollars to $25,000 on standby, cash on hand, that you can burn if something catastrophic happens to that car. This car is not under warranty. This car is expensive to fix. You got to find someone who can fix it. You got to buy the parts. You got to wait for them, all these things. If something happens, if it's, it's a spider and there's, it's got the top, it's going to need new new actuators and servos and sensors and, and mechanics. If these cars need any sort of drivetrain component, let's be honest. These cars, they're 20 plus years old. And for example, you say, well, okay, you know, you can get the manual transmission or an auto. It's not really an automatic. It's an automated manual transmission. These are the F1 style transmissions. They are primitive. They are not dual clutch automatics, DCTs. That's not what's in these cars. We're going to talk about the Lamborghini Gallardos as well. They're similar in that regard. These are automated manual transmissions. These cars, particularly the 360s, okay, the first thing you got to know is when was the last time that clutch was serviced, replaced, and what's the life? They, they can plug into these cars and then get a percentage, a wear percentage on the clutch. That's a big deal on a Ferrari 360. We're talking about thousands of dollars to have that replaced. So you see one of these on Auto Trader, car gurus, 80,000, 60,000, 75,000, I don't know. Wow, what a deal, I can own a Ferrari. That's almost the same money as my Mustang or my Challenger or Camaro. Yeah, but the car needs $20,000 of work. See where I'm going with this? So, you got to do your research. Maintenance records are everything on these cars. Should you buy that 360? Now, again, beautiful cars, but I want you to have 20% of cash on hand that pff, you can burn. Because if something significant happens to that and you dump that 20K in, I don't know if you'll ever get it back. Maybe some Ferrari collector will tell you, oh, it's the best investment you ever made. I don't know that. Generally speaking, cars are bad investments. They're not investments. They're expenses. It's an expense for a hobby or for daily transportation or for your enjoyment, but it is literally a money pit. And you might want to, you know, 
have an option of sort of burning your money in the street if you start dumping money into a car like this. It's either going to work out or it's not, but it can be extremely expensive. Okay, so you got to be aware of that. The other option would be like the next generation of comparable car, like the Ferrari F430. It's you're probably looking at, I would say, 120 to 150 K. So these are six figure cars all day long to get one that you'd actually want. But again, you got to look at maintenance records and my same 20 percent metric is going to apply just because you can afford the car and you figured out your financials doesn't mean that there's not a catastrophe. Engine failure, transmission failure, needs a new clutch, engine got to come out, needs heads, needs a bunch of electrical work. Yeah, that, that's a big deal. That can be a big deal. I want you to have 20% of whatever this first exotic car is, supercar, especially if it's out of warranty, it's an older car, 20% minimum, cash on hand, ready to burn on that car, and you might never get it back. Very important considerations. But guys, listen, it's not all gloom and doom. If you can afford it, if the timing is right, you will enjoy the Ferrari 360, the F430. Are you kidding me? They're beautiful cars, okay? It's still a Ferrari. Like the fact that it's 20 years old, whatever, 15 years old, it is about as beautiful as a rolling work of art as can possibly exist in the world. It will be a constant conversation piece. You will feel special every time you drive it. It'll be a special driving experience, okay? But it comes with a cost. What do we used to say about boats? What's a boat? A boat is a hole in the water that you throw money in. Then there's another funny joke about boats. Your buddy CJ giving you funny dad jokes tonight. The other funny uh, joke about boats is, you know, the two best days of boat ownership. The first day you buy it and the day you sell it and you wave goodbye to the new owner. Guys, the same thing might apply to your 20-year-old Ferrari. It might be the best experience of your life and, and tremendous fun and enjoyment and really up your game in the hobby and be your pride and joy, or it could go sideways financially. Real talk. We got to talk about these things because if you talk to, depending on who you talk to, they might try to talk you into this. And yeah, you want a Ferrari, maybe you're all lathered up in your mind that you're going to go buy it. I just want to give you some food for thought before you run out and do it. I would never try to talk you out of it for the sake of talking you out of it. You know, real car guy talk. That's what we're all about. Let's look at this car, okay? Because I think if you're looking at Ferrari 360s, 430s, we got to talk about this guy, okay? Let's look at this beauty. Okay, what are we looking at here? Lamborghini Gallardo. You know, they made this car, I think, for about 10 years, like 2004 to 2014. You got the V10, okay? Okay. They are ridiculous. These cars, <laughs> you know, they're solid. The drivetrains are notorious for being solid. I will say generally, and I, I, I should say, you know, the Gallardo's less than the Huracans in terms of being solid. Don't get me wrong. People have wonderful ownership experiences with the Gallardo's, but there's a couple things you got to be aware of. One, if you get like, because there was a facelift, at least one facelift in these cars, like the ones from 2013, 14, Etc. You'll notice, you know, they look a bit different than like the 2004, five, and six. Look at the front of them. There was a facelift, and there were other updates. And there's a difference in price point. Like you want to step into a Gallardo, you know, you're you're looking again. You're not getting a Gallardo that you'd want for less than 100k. Are they out there? Maybe, but these are highly desirable cars. All right, and you're going to pay for it. And my same metric, you know, and you're you're you can spend 120, 130, 140, 150 on one of these. You know, they've kind of leveled out. Everything has had a bit of a downturn with the economic downturn, the high interest rates. But generally speaking, it's going to be an expensive car to buy. But my metric of 20% cash on hand to burn applies to this car too. This car also has that F1 style transmission. It is not an automatic as we know them today, like a DCT. These are not dual clutch transmission. The biggest difference, if you've driven a Gallardo and then, for example, you've driven a Huracan, there's a big difference. Don't let anybody tell you different. Oh, the Gallardo's a better deal. It's just a few years older. Not so much. Not so much. Drive the cars. Now, Gallardo is a great driving experience. There are built versions of these cars with a 1,000 horsepower. There are two-wheel drive, all-wheel drive versions of these cars. But again, you know, that 
It's a different driving experience with an automated manual versus a dual clutch transmission. You have a clutch there. They're going to slip. They're going to be harsh. They're, they are not known for being terribly smooth and there can be maintenance challenges with them. So your driving experience, depending if you're tooling around town, if you're taking it on the track, if you're, if you're doing kind of long distance road trips, that type of thing, drive these cars and see what you think is the advice from your buddy, CJ. But again, I don't have anything bad to say about any of these cars, but there's things you gotta be aware of. I always say, I want you guys to go in eyes wide open. When you consider buying something like a, you know, a, uh, a 15 to 20 year old Lamborghini, you gotta be eyes wide open. I want you to be eyes wide open because I don't want you to get in over your head and you might if something goes sideways with the ownership experience, if you have a catastrophic meltdown of the drivetrain, just because you can afford the car by the skin of your teeth doesn't mean it's right for you right now. Maybe you should wait. Real talk from your buddy CJ, only because I care. Now, again, this would be a viable option as sort of the, your first supercar, your first super sports car. These are all viable options. And I, and I think they're interesting options. And there could be a lot of fun and joy to be had. But eyes wide open, people. Uh, I, I want you to have eyes wide open. All right. Let's look at something else because we have to. I call these the big three in this realm. So if we looked at Ferrari, sort of a starting point, a starter Ferrari. Is there such a thing? you know, without breaking the bank. That's what we're talking about tonight. A starter Lamborghini or a starter McLaren. Let's talk about McLaren. I did a whole other episode on this, guys. Check it out on my channel. But ownership of McLaren, what we're looking at here, if you were going to, you know, looking for my first super sports car, my first supercar, my first true exotic, okay, a McLaren MP4-12C, commonly known as the 12C, is what we're looking at here. You know, you can pick these up for around 100K, you know, you can pick these up, you know, 80, 90, 100, 120. You know, they came out, I believe, in 2012, but whoop, whoop, we got to talk about the red flag here. These cars are notorious for having issues. It's not that I would tell you don't ever consider buying one, but you gotta be eyes wide open. Certainly, if you buy a 12C McLaren like this one, it's ridiculously fast. Look at those doors. We call those billionaire doors <laughs> or butterfly doors or scissor doors, you know? Uh, what I'll tell you is you gotta have that 20% on hand. Disposable cash that you can burn, dump into this car because if it has problems and it's out of warranty, you might be able to get a warranty for this car, but it's going to cost you. That's another factor. But if you don't have the warranty, a repair can be big money, guys. This has a high-tech monocoque composite chassis, okay? This has high-tech suspension. Everything is high-tech. This does have a true dual-clutch transmission. This is a very fast, high-performing car. Ridiculous. It's a 200-mile-per-hour car, Okay. But again, if it has electronic problems, electrical gremlins, that McLarens, let's be blunt, especially the 12Cs, they were known for that. Real talk. I have to say it. I'm not bashing McLarens. I love McLarens. I will own another McLaren. Okay? But if this is your first exotic or supercar, you need to consider these things. Okay? There's also the McLaren 570S or 570GT, another great entry point into this world of exotic cars and supercars, what I will tell you there, you know, you, now that's a step up in price point. They're kind of, they were depreciating quite intensely for a while, but they've kind of leveled out. You know, everything is down a bit, but again, 120K, 140K, 160K, you'll find them in that range. They'll generally be more money than a 12C. But again, 12Cs are known to have some problems. 570 is a bit more stable. And there are people who have put tens and tens of thousands on McLaren, tens of thousands of miles on McLaren 570 GTs and 570 Ss and have not had any or many problems. But then you will know of people, you will talk to people who've owned these cars and have had terrible experiences with the 570s. I know I talk to a lot of people who own these cars and who have, some of them have sworn off McLaren. Some of them love it. Some of them have stepped up to a 720S. 
Some of them have an Artura now. Like there is a lot of brand loyalty here, but then there are also people who've had bad experiences. I have to be blunt and honest. So I loved my McLaren. I had a 570 GT. I would absolutely get another one. I've been close to pulling the trigger on a couple. I got some things in the works, but uh, you know, you got to go into it eyes wide open. A warranty is probably a must, but also my, my, I keep saying I'm like a broken record tonight. I'm like a broken record tonight, but you got to have 20% of cash on hand, 20% of the value of the vehicle that you can put into it and just burn it. Like I got to be real with you. That's a part of ownership and real world experience for many people with exotic cars. So now that we talked about the big three, the other thing I want to tell you is there are some, some bargains out there. Some reasonable buys and bargains stepping up from like American cars or Japanese performance cars. If you want to go true exotic, you know, and, and just experience that aspect of the hobby, you know, let's talk about some bargains that'll kind of get you there, but not really. In some ways they might be better, but in some ways it's not going to be the, the true exotic or supercar experience that you're seeking. Trust me. Uh, maybe you feel differently. Leave me comments. So let's talk about this car. Okay, this is an Audi R8, okay? This is a, a super sports car, I would say. Uh, the styling is understated in an R8. I've never been a huge fan of the R8. I've wanted to like this car more than I do. This is just me. I got to tell you my perspective, and you leave me your comments if you feel differently. You know, the R8s have that understated styling. You know, it kind of blends in. It doesn't stand out as much. Some people love the styling. To me, it's got more of a high-tech look as opposed to some of the other cars we just looked at are a heck of a lot more aggressive and overstated. Like, they, they are statement cars. If you're looking for a statement car, it's not the R8, in my opinion. A statement car, an extension of your personality, if you will, uh, something that really you turn it, you, you look at it in the parking lot, you say, oh, my God, I love that car. For me, the R8 was never that car. You know, the Ferrari, the McLaren, the Lamborghini, certain other cars, like, I get excited to this day when I look at them. I'm, I'm the same way with Corvettes. You know, I, I love Corvettes. The R8, I could take it or leave it. I'll be honest. The other thing too, I will tell you is look at the, I say this is a bargain. Audi R8s are bargains, particularly some of these, you know, the older ones, they depreciate more aggressively. They depreciate more aggressively and then they level out. Like you can get into an R8 for 60 to 80 K and listen, they're not bad. They're interesting cars. Right. And there, there's the V8, there's the V8, V10 models. Uh, you know, what I'll tell you is, you know, you, you, you can have a really good experience with these, but my 20% metric still applies. And the 20% of the cost of the vehicle you should have on hand, you know, if something goes, you know, if you get the all wheel drive, if you buy an R8, you should probably get all wheel drive, right? That's kind of what Audi's known for. Maybe not. Some people like that rear wheel drive experience. You can, you can drift it perhaps a bit more if you're on the track. But uh, that all-wheel drive system, if something goes wrong with it, big money. That V8 or that V10, that's a high-performance engine. The electronics in these cars, the suspension, anything on a car like this is going to be expensive. Again, your price point, you can get these cars for Mustang money. You know, let's be blunt. You can get these cars for Corvette money. Should you? That's up to you. You know, what are you looking to get out of it? Is it a weekend cruiser? Is it going to be a daily? Is it going to be something you're just going to take to the car shows? Are you looking to track it? Uh, do you, you want to, you know, get something that's European? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the R8 is an option. It's just, you know, do you, do you buy into the styling? I don't want you to settle. I guess my message is if you want to step up to exotics, get the one you want. And I'm not telling you to overexert yourself or overextend yourself. But what I am telling you is wait till the timing is right. If an R8 is cheaper and you say, well, I could buy the R8, maybe it's not time to buy the R8 if you really want the Ferrari. Okay. Just things to think about. Delayed gratification. Where are you at in life? The phases and priorities. Your buddy CJ wants you to think about those things before you pull the trigger. But again, if the timing is right, R8 could be a viable option for you. And they're bargains. I consider this a bargain car to get into exotics. Let's talk about another bargain car. And maybe you're going to say, CJ, there's no way that's a bargain car. Tell me if you agree or disagree in the comments.
Love to hear from you. Check this out. Porsche 911. I believe that's a 2014 example. I believe that's a Carrera S. You can get into these and it doesn't have to be a 2014. You know, you can go with like an 09, an 08, different generations, the 997, the, the 991. Let's say nothing later than like a 991. This happens to be a 991 generation of the 911. I have a whole other episode where we talk about some of those things. But, you know, that 60 to 80 to 100K, maybe stretching into the, you know, the 110s, the 110s, you can get a lot of Porsche and you will love that car. And it, it's solid. And generally speaking, the maintenance cost, generally speaking, your maintenance costs on a Porsche like this will generally be lower. I say generally. Have I said generally lately? Hello? Is this thing on? Did I say generally? The, the maintenance costs of a Porsche will generally be lower than some of those others, but not necessarily. Again, these flat six engines, um, suspension, electronics. Listen, these are not inexpensive cars, but you know my 20% metric certainly still applies, but you hopefully and probably won't need it. These Porsches are very solid. Now, you will love the way this car drives. It's got that frunk, the front trunk, the frunk, okay? Um, it's got a back seat. It's really a back seat for little people, for the kids, or for groceries. I have, a, I have a photo of a watermelon. No, I'm not kidding. And if you people really want to see it, leave me comments if you want to see my footage, my photos of a watermelon that I strapped in the back seat, in the seatbelt, in my 911. I got photos, but I'm only showing them upon request. <laughs> and I do so under protest. I got photos of a watermelon strapped in the back seat of my 911. I do. Back to the point. So you got a, a useful back seat for storage for little human beings, <laughs> maybe for a dog or cat. This is a useful car and it's a fun car. Now, what it isn't, in CJ's opinion, your buddy CJ's opinion, this is not an ex a, a, this is not an aggressively styled in your face, exotic supercar. It's just not, it's a sports car. This is a sports car. It is exotic, but it's understated. 911s have always been the gentleman's sports car, right? Especially what you'd get into as a starter 911. You know, like my first 911, when I stepped up into exotics, it was a, it was a base 911 and I enjoyed it. I'd buy the car again, but don't ever get it twisted that this car will stand out aggressively, you know, and if you're looking for something to say, I want more of a statement car in your face, sounds like a dragon, looks like a monster, sends fear down the spine of regular human beings. That's not the 911. You know, it is a driver's car. It is an enthusiast's car. People will, will want to talk to you about it. You can hang out with the Porsche guys, a lot of cool things. But again, it's understated. I compare it with the R8 in some ways. Although I'd rather have the Porsche 911 than an R8 any day of the week. That's just me. Um, it is it is in that understated bracket. Um, you know, a couple other things on these car guys, on these cars, guys. And I want to go back and, for example, I want to look at, I want to look at, let's, for example, look at the Lamborghini. Things to beware of. I want you guys to be, be, be aware and beware of, okay? If you're looking at stepping into exotic cars, and for example, here's our Lamborghini Gallardo again. Salvage titles, branded titles, lemons, okay? Flood cars, be careful. What might seem like a bargain and what could be, these rebuilt cars, there's a whole market out there. There's a whole sub area of the industry around branded titles, salvage, rebuilds, flood cars. Be careful. Dealer buybacks. Be careful. I can't, I'm going to full transparency. You know me. I give it to you straight. I've never bought a car under those auspices. I've never bought a, a car with a branded title, but I know enough, been in this game long enough to know that there could be insurance, financing, registration, title concerns, there's, there's a process and there's implications to it. You could be faced with some complications. Once you buy this car, even if you enjoy it, what happens when you go to sell it? Are you going to, again, lose your shirt? 
Your buddy CJ never wants you to lose your shirt. So I just say, if you're looking to get into exotic cars and you'll see them out there on Car Gurus, on Auto Trader, on Facebook Marketplace, you know, here's a McLaren with a, with a dealer buyback and it's $50,000 less than comparable McLarens. Oh, I want to buy it. Do your research. Make sure you know, eyes wide open, what you're getting into with salvage titles, dealer buybacks, lemons, flood cars. What might seem like a good idea in hindsight might end up hurting you. And I don't want you to have a bad experience. So again, do your research. It's beyond the scope of, of this podcast episode to really get into the implications there. But, um, you know, do your homework. Um, the other thing I will tell you is, and let's, let's pull this up one more time. I want to look at this. You know, we love looking at things together on this show and it's just a big part of it. And I want to hear from you guys in the comments. So let's take a look at this car and I want you to be true and honest to yourself. I'm talking to you. If you're thinking about getting your first exotic sports car, supercar, and you're looking at, for example, our friend, the Ferrari 360 here, the 20 year old Ferrari 360, let's say for $110,000. Okay. If you buy this car, are you going to be afraid to drive it? I'm talking to you real talk tonight. If you buy this car for $110,000 and you followed your buddy CJ's advice, you got 20 grand in the bank, liquid, disposable, ready to dump into this car, because that was my other advice to you, because it could be an expensive car to own. You got to be ready for that. So knowing all of that and your clutch is expensive and your timing belts are expensive and everything's expensive on this car, the tires are expensive. I don't want you to buy a car if you're at a phase in life because of income and financial constraints, you're going to be afraid to drive. Or even if you have the disposable income, Ask yourself the question, if I have a $120,000 Ferrari sitting in my garage and my buddies want to go on a 150-mile road trip and that's my only performance fun car, am I going to be willing to put 300 miles on it round trip that weekend and be far away in the mountains someplace or at the beach, okay, where I don't know any Ferrari dealers and I'm worried about getting it towed to a garage I trust because there's only a handful of garages that you really want working on this in your hometown, let alone some other damn place. This, if, if you are obsessed about those things, these are valid concerns, but I would say, ask yourself these questions. Like what type of hobbyist are you? Are you a weekend cruiser with the shades on and, and put a few miles on it and put it back on the battery tender and, and, and go do something else? Are you a road trip guy? A couple hundred miles, some weekends or more. Are you a car show, car meet guy? Okay. Is this thing going to spend most of its life in your garage under a cover? You got to ask yourself these questions. And based on those reality, uh, real concerns and where you're at as a hobbyist, is this car going to meet your expectations? Because for 120 K, if you told me you want a car, you could drive the wheels off of, as we say on the, on the show, I might strongly suggest you look at a Corvette or a Porsche. Okay. Uh, or something that's known to be a bit more reliable and better suited, or maybe, maybe you know, hey, look, go with the fully loaded Mustang GT500. Okay, that car will give you a lot of thrills. It is not an exotic car. It is a super powerful sports car and, and slash muscle car, but you can drive it knowing that any Ford dealership in the United States, however many there are, leave me comments if you know, there's a lot. Any, wherever you are in the United States, you can take it to a Ford dealership. You can get parts, okay? Whereas with the Ferrari or the Lamborghini or the McLaren, it's a concern, right? If I road trip with this car, if I'm a road tripper, is this the right car for me? If it's going to be my only car. So I want you to think about some of these things, guys. So that's pretty much it. The question is, if you can buy a Ferrari on a Corvette budget, should you? That's kind of what we talked about tonight. If you can buy a Lamborghini for Dodge, Hellcat, SRT, Red Eye money, should you? And the answers may vary. And in general, it depends. It depends on a lot of the things we talked about tonight. You know, it depends on a lot of the things we talked about tonight. And it, 
includes your priorities, your financial position, okay? The reality of how you plan on using the car, what's your appetite for high costs of ownership and for potentially losing a lot when you go to sell it. These are all things, these are all questions only you can answer, but I want you to be eyes wide open, guys. I want you to be eyes wide open. I want you to have a fantastic ownership experience. Guys, we enjoy this hobby. We love it. And we love it and enjoy it together. It's about the cars. It's about the people. It's about talking about cars. And that's what we do on Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. Tonight was a little bit different. We talked about not only some incredible cars. Every car in this episode was incredible. Hello, leave me comments if you disagree. I'll take any one of those cars all day and just have fun with it. If you got one of those cars, call me. We'll go for a ride. But, uh, you know, guys, that was really the purpose of tonight's episode was to say, if we're looking to step up into exotic sports cars or supercars, what are some viable options, okay, as entry points into the exotic or supercar realm? But then also, what are the considerations, eyes wide open, that you should think about seriously before making that jump into this other tier of our hobby? So guys, that's it for tonight's episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Please give me a like and subscribe. Leave me comments. Let me know if you agree or disagree. I'll respond to all the comments I can. Hot Seat Automotive Media Podcast. Your buddy CJ signing off for the night. You know I love you and I'll see you on the next one. Peace. Peace.